Hello everyone. Hello everyone. My name is D2 Kasui. I am president of the Urban Financial Services Coalition Advisory Board of, of the Urban Financial Services Coalition. And I'm also a member of Kasui and Associates and we are happy to welcome you to our special session uh, today. And this is Black History Month. So hello, Black History Month. I'd like to say happy Black History Month to all of you. And we are glad that you are able to join us for this very special session today entitled Unpacking Diversity Within People of Color. And we have a very special speaker that we will have discussing today's program with us. And I'm so excited about this young man because he is up to big things. And, you know, I met him when he was wobbling just a little bit. You know, he was just doing a little something, something. And now we see he's doing big things. And we're so excited to see the sons of UFSC grow and to do big, exciting things. And it's always good to have our colleagues from across the border, our Canadian cousins, to be a part of our discussion today. So before we get started, we always had a little networking as a part of our program. And then we usually like to hear from a member of our Urban Financial Services Coalition National Board. Hopefully I can tag in my colleague after our networking session, the UFSC National President. We will always like to yield and give her an opportunity to share a few of her thoughts in particular, and then we will introduce the speaker and get on with our discussion. And for those of you who just joined the line, I would encourage all of you to put your name and the organization you're with and the city or state you're calling from into the chat so we can know who is in the room. And we would also encourage you to put your LinkedIn profile, put your LinkedIn profile so others can connect with you after the program. Because I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of time in the networking section before you know, I get a, a bunch of nasty, <laughs> not nasty, but I get a little encouraging chat. Say, hey, we didn't have enough time in the chat. So you'll be able to continue the conversation after today's program by connecting with individuals on LinkedIn. So why don't we go ahead and uh, get started with today's program. We're going to do our networking session. And in the networking session, here's what I would like for you to do. We're going to use the the Zoom breakout room function. And with the yes. Zoom breakout room function, yes. you will be able to, we got a hot mic. In the Zoom breakout room session, you will be able to, um, I want you to share your name, the organization that you're with, and share one best practice for supporting diversity and inclusion initiatives that you've seen that has worked in, in either in your current company or um, that you know that have worked maybe in another organization. Either one would allow for um, individuals to be able to, um, to share. So what I want you to share, your name, organization, and best practice that, um, that you know supports diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives. Hi, it's Erica. Who can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you, Erica. Okay. Um. Yeah. I clearly was having some um audio and technical problems, so I was taken out of the room. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. You probably don't so even know, you probably don't even know what room you were in. Um. No, I don't. I'm <laughs> sorry. No. I don't have a video on my screen no more either. Okay, now I do. Yes. Well, don't worry. They're, they're going to be coming back in, in, in one minute. So you you okay. can share with me. How about that? You and me can share <laughs> okay. together. Uh, I'm Erica Tosi. I um, work for the NEIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, their central headquarters. And um, as far as diversity and inclusion, um, 
fairly new to my company, unfortunately, but just overall, I think one of the key things is, you know, um, well, there's a lot of things, but just being aware of like unconscious biases and just more awareness in general. I think every individual, it, I think it starts with an awareness and accountability. Because um, unconsciously, we, we have so many biases that we're not aware of. And I think like working on those and just moving forward from there, I think it's just one key start. Um, but of course, there's like so many other other issues or so other things. But um, I think that's just one start, basically. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric, for sharing that. And you're in the great mm -hmm. state of Missouri, so that is <laughs> yeah. great. There's a lot of great African Americans and financial professionals in Kansas City. I know that mm -hmm. my, our colleague Ola May True Love. Do you know uh, Madam True Love? Yes, I do know Miss Ola. All right. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. I see we also have uh, Karima and Marlene. Karima and Marlene, do y'all want to go ahead and say hi? Hi, good evening. It's Karima. Yes, Karima, where are you calling in from? Thank you. Thanks for asking. Uh, I work, uh, uh, I'm calling from Ontario, Canada. Uh, and I work for the Ontario Public Service. Okay, welcome, welcome. It's always Thank good you. to have our, our colleagues north of the border. Thank you, appreciate that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we were doing, Karima, is uh, you know sharing our name and organizations that we're with, and was also sharing one of our diversity and inclusion best practices. Do you have a, a best practice that you would like to share with us? Um. I think one of the things is when we're when we're working, I work in communications. So when we're scheduling events or focus groups, sessions, uh, we're mindful and respectful of, of communities that we're going into. Um, we have, for example, a religious um, holiday Two, faith calendar. One. And we ensure that we're looking at those dates before scheduling uh, events to be respectful of those communities. Extremely, extremely powerful. You know, one of the things is, is really about when we think about being inclusive is do we use all the tools that are available to us? And a lot of times there are different type of calendars that share different types of holidays and seasons that all of our colleagues or our employees um, may have. And a lot of times people are just ignorant to it, right, because they, they're not aware. Um, but when you start thinking about meeting people's needs, you become more conscious to that. And then you can you know, take those things into account when you make your plans. And I, I know people really, really appreciate that when people take into account um, people's uh, differences um, as they uh, continue to work things um, forward. Well, thank you so much, Karima, for sharing. We got everybody back. Did everybody have enough time in their networking group? No, no. <laughs> Never enough time. Never enough time. <laughs> I know, I know. It's never yeah, enough like time. One of us. Well, I'm, I'm going to have to work. We're going to have to work on our elevator pitch approach to all of our uh, networking session. And then we're going to schedule a session that's just going to be focused on networking so that y'all can have all the time that you need to be able to network. Uh, so with that, I'd like to now transition to our Urban Financial Services Coalition National President. Miss Ola May True Love. Miss True Love. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kasui. I just wanted to take this opportunity to, first of all, thank all of you for joining the call this evening and also let you know that we are so excited about our keynote speaker this evening. As we all know, things are very different for us across the United States and in Canada and just learning and, and networking with our cousins as D2 referred Bentley as it's, it's awesome. One of the things that we are doing at the national level is continuing to embrace, educate, inform and provide financial intelligence to all of our members. And I want to empower you to be a part of this organization if you're not 
by joining us. We'd love to have you as our member. We can be reached on our website at www.ufscnet.org. And as we move forward in 2021, we actually did awesome in 2020, although we were in those unprecedented times with what was going on across the world with the virus and with the unrest that was going on and all the injustices that happened to us people of color, but Urban Financial Services, we thrived. As we look forward to our 50th anniversary in 2024, I'd love for everyone that's on this call to be engaged and I'd love for you to help us be successful in everything that we plan to do for our 50th anniversary coming up, as I said, in 2024. Today, I was sharing a little earlier that the weather has been pretty crazy for us here in the Midwest and all across America. And if you have been involved with any of this horrific weather, I'd like to uh, request that you take good care of yourself and be safe, stay warm, and let's get involved with this awesome organization. I thank you for a moment this evening, Mr. Kasui, and I look forward to talking to each and every one of you. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Many blessings. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam True Love. It's truly a pleasure to be on your team serving. You know, one of the things I can tell all of you is that Miss True Love, Madam True Love, National President, she is a taskmaster. She 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 cracks the whip on us. I know tonight she's already counting the number of us and verbal interrupters I've been using tonight. We have Urban Financial Services Coalition. We have a Toastmasters group that meets on the first and third uh, Tuesday of every month. We'll definitely give you some information to those of you who are interested in taking your speaking skills to the next level. So I know I have a grammarian tonight <laughs> that will be counting my ahs and verbal <laughs> interrupters tonight. So thank you, Madam President. I appreciate you. I appreciate the push that you give us to go to the next level. Now I'd like to transition to our speaker of the night, where we're actually going to have a conversation. And this young man, as I shared earlier with you, became, I, we first encountered him when the Toronto chapter of Urban Financial Services Coalition submitted his name to be in the Eastern Region Oratorical Competition. Now, I'm a part of the Richmond chapter of Urban Financial Services Coalition, and we call ourselves the Extraordinary Richmond Chapter. We had anticipated going to the regional Eastern Region and taking the crown uh, back home and having our person go to the national level. Denley, like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, upset the whole apple cart. <laughs> and he went on to become national, international orator of the year for Urban Financial Services uh, Coalition. And since then, he's done a lot of big things. He's now the CEO of Renew IQ. Our speaker's goal is to provide leadership that engages and empowers management and staff while leveraging his experience in cultural transformation. He shares, his, he shares best practices of people development, um, i.e. human resources to develop an organization's culture and talent. He helps organizations, including ministries, to envision creating safe spaces for staff and management who see the value of diversity, inclusion, and equity. And to practice those values, as a high performing, inclusive, and anti racist organization. For over 15 years, our speaker has drawn upon his various experiences as a pastor, executive coach, public ser servant, project manager, engineer, social scientist, theologian, and community leader, and I would also add husband and father to relate to his various stakeholder groups and deliver on their needs. Our speaker is currently acts in the role of inclusion and understanding advisor for the Meeting House. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause to Deadly W. McIntosh. Hey welcome, guys. welcome, Deadly. Hey, hey, D2, thank you for, for that reading. It's making me blush. If you didn't see it on the screen, but it's there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I reached out to you uh, back in January to kind of discuss the opportunity. I saw a lot of the good work that you were doing on LinkedIn and some of the diversity and inclusion conversations that you were having and was so appreciative of you taking time out of your busy schedule between various other speaking engagements to give us a few minutes of your time tonight to talk a little bit about um, diversity of inclusion, but from the pers perspective of unpacking diversity and inclusion for people of color. And so before we dive deep into that, let's get let's have just a little conversation about you know COVID-19. Um, mm. Share with us how you've been handling the COVID-19 pandemic and what's one insight that you learned about yourself during COVID-19 and what's one activity as a result of COVID-19 that you've been able to get done that you normally would not have gotten done? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, how's, how's COVID has impacted us? I think over here in Canada that uh, it's less political. I mean, there's politics involved, like, like any uh, country or jurisdiction that has to wrestle with uh, having the right balance of lockdown, mass uh, mandates. Uh, but I think from, from the standpoint for me, you know what, it hasn't really bothered me as such. I think for, for me, you kind of look at the world that you live in and say, you're, uh, there's a saying that you either, human beings are either going to trouble or in trouble or coming out of trouble. <laughs> it's not just the, 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 our lot in life. So uh, for me, it's you know recognizing we have seasons it's, it's uncomfortable i love to travel love to go with my family but you know as i tell my children my wife that uh these these are opportunities when we get to build character these are opportunities when we truly uh figure out that we're not so self-consumed but we're truly other centered and i think that uh one of the things i'm noticing at least on how i'm handling it i really am asking the question am i truly my brother's keeper that might truly my sister's keeper that might mm. truly uh respecting the fact that uh relationships come over rights uh which is not always an easy thing so i think one of the things i've learned during this time uh is definitely more humility to know there is real real challenges for people who are working on front line big up to those doctors and nurses and all the other frontline workers uh to be very mindful, prayerful, thoughtful about them. I think that's one of the things I've picked up even more. Uh, and being a better dad, I, I think I think you, so you get exposed to well, a better husband, better dad, because as you know, that this time has been fraught with domestic violence uh, because people don't know how to get along with each other in, a, in, in tight spaces for an extended period of time. So I, I think that some of the things that have exposed is that we really had some relational People have relational challenges that they didn't didn't get a chance to work on, and I think with for me it, it really kind of dig deep of how am I going to engage with my children, engage with my wife, engage with my friends. Uh, so I think those are the things I've kind of learned about myself in terms of being more patient, being more other centered, and really understand my children and wife in terms of this, the needs of of belonging and feeling heard in, when in this time of stress. The last thing I would say in terms of of what I've been uh, particular activities is this. <laughs> I think the, the the speaking business in terms of video has been booming. So I think it's really an opportunity for me to do this. Absolutely. I love all the things you said, especially other center. You know, we live in a world of individualism that celebrates individualism. And now if ever in any time before, you know, it's a really big question, are, are we, our brother's keeper, are we our sister's keeper? And also, it also highlights, you know, how blessed some of us are. And when I think about all the things that we've been able to do and not experience, you know, some of our colleagues are not in the same situation, or it's it just even from the from the perspective of, you know, being able to work from home 
and have the space to be able to work from home. You know, for so many people, you know, they're working from home also means that they're also a professor at one point and <laughs> another point they may be also, you know, uh, wearing another hat and also, you know, dealing with the plumbing and dealing with something else and taking care of pets. And, and at the same time, you know, trying to keep the conversation with their boss going at all at the same time. I, and I know that some of our, our colleagues are good at multitasking, um, but there's only so much level of multitasking <laughs> that everybody can do. So the other thing, uh, Danley, let's talk a little bit about, you know, who are your role models? You know, you know, who are one or two people that had a profound impact on you and helped you to create your own personal philosophy of who you are? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a very interesting question. So I think from a couple standpoints, obviously a person of faith, uh, you know, monitoring and tracking and a person of faith with Jesus, that's been a very big uh, cornerstone in terms of how I've developed this understanding of other centeredness and value-based leadership or servant leadership. Uh, so I think that's sort of like a, the default there baseline. But uh, others, I, I would, Nelson Mandela has been one person that has been very interesting to me. Uh, I, I think, you know, Dr. King goes without saying, but one of the things I found uh, with Diba, Dr. Mandela, was this fact of uh, being able to live, not only doing the civil rights, doing a, a, the things that we see today, he did that in South Africa, but actually got into office, uh, seeing, so playing both sides, being in, in the, political uh, side of things and being in the grassroots. One of, the, one of the things I found interesting that that I find myself in that, I've been in the grassroots, been in the corporate and in, in, in within the bureaucracy. And so seeing both sides, how it's necessary to have different voices to get the results that you need, where when you're on the streets, you got the street of a prophet, right? You got the prophet voice. The prophetic voice but when you're at the kitchen table when you're sitting in front of people dignitaries or diplomats then you have to have the teaching voice right you have to be able to engage and, and speak and when i look at mandela he did it so marvelously with fw de clerk when he was in, in uh when he was in prison in robbins island and how he had to use that sort of engagement skill he couldn't use the street prophetic voice he had to use the engaging teaching voice to to interact and put pressure to make some changes what i also thought what made him also interesting for me is that in living in canada we have such a pluralistic culture different races and ethnicity and, and lived experiences and i think when i thought about mandela where he was in a culture where he had to manage different races in terms of the tribal or uh, possible tribalism down there uh with in south africa race obviously with the Africanas, the, the white South Africans and the British South Africans and people of color, uh, whether it be Asian, South Asians. And he also had people who had different political beliefs, right? Those who are communists in terms of their understanding or, or socialists and those who are, are who you may call more capitalists, being able to take all those people, different uh, ideas and say, how can we find a common South Africa, right? That's inspiring to me because I think the, what's the biggest issue today is the divided states of America, divided uh, parts in, in Canada, you, you name it. How do we have leaders that bring different ideas, diverse ideas bring together? Uh, so I think for him, at this point in my life has been very influential. Dr. King goes without saying in terms of this, obviously my, my, my faith background in term, and being able to speak, speak to uh, truth to power. But I, Mandela, even more so because of the fact that uh, the culture is a little more similar to ours in Canada, at least where I am in Toronto. Um, absolutely. Uh, two of my favorite, those are two of my favorites, or three of my favorites, you know. Uh, so I definitely uh, appreciate that. And being from uh, the continent, we have a, a, a deep faith and a deep proudness in uh, Nelson Mandela. And, and you're right, he was a person that really went from the streets, you know, from the tribe, right? Yeah. <laughs> from the tribe, you know, all the way through the bureaucracy and really went through seasons, 
of how he fought the struggle. And I, right. I like to think that a lot of you on the on the phone tonight um, have gone through different uh, seasons. You know, you're probably, you know, in uh, not yet. Yeah, some of you are not that much seasoned, <laughs> probably started in the streets, and, you know, and now you're, you know, at the table inside of your companies. Uh, now trying to make a difference and having those conversations. And now you're a part of the conversation about how change is gonna make. And so hopefully all of you have also have people who are inspirational um, to you and provide you guidance. They, said, they say that you can tell the, uh, how powerful people are by who they admire. And so what I wanna encourage all of you to, um, to do tonight Go ahead and give us um, in the chat a couple of names of people who have inspired you and that who are driving you to do the type of work that you're doing today or have you know, provided you some, um, some prayers, some love, some wisdom, some guidance. You can go ahead and give them some credit tonight by throwing their names in the chat as Denley and I continue the conversation. Um, Denley, the, the other thing I'd like to tap into before we uh, go into our conversation for the night. Tell us a little bit about how you got introduced to Urban Financial Services Coalition and what were some of your, and how did you get into the oratorical competition? T tell us a little bit about how all that got started. Yeah, I, I remember I, it, it was actually through a relationship we had in our chapter at uh, in, when we were back in university. So I was running a uh, a student chapter of the National Society of Black Engineers. And part of our connecting was with the, at the time, the, the Toronto chapter of, of this organization. And I remember that the two individuals that came that, that spoke and one of them were, were the president, I said, where did you get those shoes? And what can I do to do <laughs> what you do, right? Because you're, you're obviously, you're a student, you're a popper, right? And you see, college black men coming in and speaking that did wonders and in fact obviously if you're familiar with Nesby it's all about that sort of uplifting and get people and and those who look like us in, in the STEM field uh so I remember that and then I went to one of the chapter meetings as a student and then stayed on uh so that's a what's say geez over we're talking about 2000 and 2000 I met the organization uh and so that was my exposure to the, the, the group. Then got into the chapter and then say, hey, we have this oratorical contest. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the, the group, you can come out and do it. So uh, when I won, that was actually the third time I competed. I, I lost twice before uh, in, the ch in the chapter level that I went to, the, to, I guess, the regional level where I lost and then finally I, I, I won. I uh, and but in those those times when I started to do the speaking, and then I met D two, and I know you were doing Mark uh, for I believe it, it, that the leadership uh, program with the, the students and the, which inspired me to kind of really hang around with the group. Uh, so I, I would say yeah, it was it was two thousand uh, with the, the chapter president that came uh, exposed me to the group. They had this opportunity. I jumped at it. Always wanted to speak to people in the in the U.S. And when I won that year, was really one of the highlights of my my speaking career because uh, I noticed speaking in the American audience is different than speaking to the Canadian audience. Uh, at least when I was speaking at that time, and so to be able to position things differently for different audiences was one of the things I I, I learned from that in that experience. Absolutely. And, and that's so powerful. And that's still one of the things that works today. I, I think sometimes we take it for granted, you know, being able to see professionals that look like us, that are on, on progressing in their career and moving towards, you know, big things. You know, people, young people want to see what's possible. And so when they see us in positions and when people are junior associates and they come into companies, they're looking at the top of the company. And they're definitely taking their cues from who's at the top of the company, who are the movers and shakers and are making a difference. So the work that all of us are doing is really a big deal. And especially for organizations like Urban Financial Services Coalition, it's great 
that we get these accomplishments, but it doesn't mean much if we don't inspire the next generation. And in particular, our focus is inspiring the next generation to come into the financial services industry. Reach your potential, whatever that you're, you're passionate about and consider using those superpowers and those gifts in the financial services space, you know, because wealth building does really make a difference. And so while we're on this topic, let's transition into uh, your work in diversity. Tell us how you develop the passion um, for, the, for the type of diversity work that you're doing. Yeah, you know what? <clears throat> I was thinking about this. I was thinking about uh, where that, that drive came from and kind of bringing people together. And I, and I thought about that I was born in a high priority neighborhood that was richly diverse. And when I look back in my, my student pictures and the class pictures, we had everybody under the sun, right? And white, black, brown, Asian, uh, Latina, Latino, you, you, you name the culture, we had it. And so I was in that environment, didn't really see so much uh, race, I guess, you know, in a high part neighborhood, maybe more class was an issue. And when I remember being in, in high school, being in now moving to the suburbs, being part of a culture where football, playing football, I did a whole lot of that. Uh, that was considered more the white folks did that and the black folks did the basketball. And so I wasn't, I was okay in basketball, my, had a better career in, in football, but to, be, to go in that environment to kind of start to figure out how to bridge worlds where academically, we, you know, some people, you know, it, you know what it is in the lunchroom. You have the, the brown people here, the white people here. At the high school, you start to really segregate. Uh, sports is the way that people tend to come together and kind of break those, sort of, those, those barriers. And so I think those sort of formative experiences really helped me to see diversity as important if I had to reflect. But I also then remember being in a, a church where we were predominantly a, a, what you call a black church. And I said, you know, is this the way that it should be? You know, we should be able to open up and bring other groups into the into the, the congregational space. And so my wife, at least at the time my fiance, we started to have dialogue of how do we make a black space more open to other racial groups. But it, you know, the interesting enough that who'd have thought this sort of mindset because D and I was uh, was not even in the radar. But who would have thought like that sort of mindset would have been so useful for today? Because as time went on, I found myself now in probably predominantly uh, white settings, whether it be a corporate, whether it be a church, whether it be many other places. And some of those principles there of how do I bring people together? How do, how do we see a common goal? How do we transcend some of those barriers have been very helpful? I'll give you one quick anecdote or anecdote, I should say, that the... I was in university and I remember I was leading a group of really uh, international students and they came and when we were doing a, some kind of cheer, right? And there's like, you have, you, I was acting as a mentor to them and there was about maybe 10 groups and this group of individuals, predominantly a lot of them were Asian foreign students, didn't know how to, English wasn't their strength. And I remember coming to them and say, you know what, we can win this. I don't care if you don't have, English is not your, your first language. We can win this. All you need to do is just put energy and passion. And we actually won that little bit of uh, exhibition. And they were stunned, right? It was, it, this international students. And I just remember that. It's that at the end of the day, we're all people. We all want to be understood. And, but I love just bringing people together and say, yeah, we can do this together, irrespective of our, of our background. And that's has carried me well into... The, the corporate space because I always find myself navigating in white spaces and figuring out how do I bring people together without losing yourself, right? That's the most important thing. When you go in that corporate environment, you, you want to adapt, not assimilate. And so I found that very fascinating. How do I help people adapt, not assimilate to create that integrated space? 
Um, I, I, absolutely. That that's so rich there. I, I'll love to you know really dive into um, to that particular piece. Um, there's some new language that's kind of come that's come kind of come out now in the space. I think they 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 call you know opportunity what people are covering, right? You know those um, African Americans here in the United States. You know used to have a time where people would pass, right? They're passing you know, as, you know, someone else because they can get better benefit is similar to um, covering. There's some differences, um, you know, um, with that. Um, so one of the things I'll just ask, you know, all of our colleagues who are, you know, participating on the call um, tonight is to go ahead, throw in the chat, you know, what are your thoughts of how people can adapt and not lose themselves? You know, how can they adapt and not lose themselves? You know, because you want to be able to work in an environment be true to who you are and at the same time navigate the different type of challenges. So go ahead and throw your best practices um, in there and we will get to the Q&A part um, for all of you. We just got a couple more questions we need to go through um, with Denley. So Denley, what I'd like to dive in while individuals are throwing um, good stuff in the chat is when we look, when we start talking about race and we start talking about uh, communities, oftentimes, people think about people of color as being one big group. Yeah. And then we often get, um, so it, it becomes a barrier to having conversations and that plays out in a lot of different types of stereotypes and the whole nine, you know, if you got a group of people and we're trying to decide who's gonna be on the basketball team, if you're a black person, you might get picked quickly, <laughs> right? You might think that, oh, you, you might automatically play. Or, you know, you may, when we start thinking about intellectual areas, you know, we may not see, be viewed as, you know, as smart, or as so, so, you know, so the perspective that we often um, run into is, you know, how do we peel back and deal with being lumped in or stereotyped as one big group. How do we affect it? How do we effectively deal with that and deal with people who kind of uh, kind of typecast us in one perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. If I had the answer, I think we would be better along as a society, right? I, I, I it's a tough one uh, because you don't have control how about people perceive you directly you can behave as well as you can and be polite and people have made up their mind about you and you can't really change that so there's a percentage of the population who are set in their ways but there are there's a percentage of the population who who are maybe biased in terms of racial bias and uh, have their subconscious biases in, in, in turn of how they view black folks, but proximity, if you ever heard that term, proximity matters. Being able to push beyond your comfort level, your comfort zone to to have those sort of uncomfortable conversations. And it's not always about race, but just understanding people. I think we just need to understand uh, people is a very important thing to unbundled this whole idea of being put in the box. I remember when I was working in the, the automotive, so we were a uh, supplier to, to General Motors and Tier 1, and uh, I remember being in the plant, and it was an elderly gentleman uh, named Joseph, Polish, Eastern European, and Joseph would never give me the time of day when I brought my parts in for quality or for QC check, quality control he would just always dismiss me. And it got really bad is when your parts were supposed to get out the door because I didn't want to shut down the plant because it's an assembly line and he would just go and do other parts first and other colleagues first. And you started to notice the trend. But one of the things that I found very powerful and maybe from you know folks like Mandela, this, the idea of really what's the right thing to do is to engage and still treat this individual as a colleague that's worth, that has dignity and respect. And in the time of need where other people left him, left Joseph, uh, who had worked, I stood by his side. I, I stood up for him for whatever the, the reason people did what they did. I was an honest guy with him. 
and it allowed for conversations to happen where Joseph spoke to me and he started to change. And then uh, there was one point where he, we were just talking and, you know, he had a moment where I was kind of doing the, so, you know, the workplace sort of counseling and encouragement. And he said to me, Denley, forgive me. And I said, forgive me for, for, for what? What did I do, Joe? What am I forgiving you about? He said, forgive me because I had you wrong. And I saw only black people on television to be basketball players. And I'm an engineer, like by study. So that's where I came up with. He didn't see someone look like me. And Joseph said, I only knew black people to be this and only to be violent. And you changed that. And I, I have to apologize to you for it. I didn't know better. And I said, well, Joseph, uh, that's fine. I mean, we're not all like that. I, I do play sports, but there's more to me than sports. And, I, and so it's the proximity and the persistence. And I bet I was still myself, but it, it created opportunities to talk. And so he had to, he kind of had to break that down in that way. That's in the general sense. Uh, one more illustration in terms of kind of grouping us together. You know, as you learn so quickly in detail, we were talking on how important it is for uh, to help our, our white brothers and sisters to recognize that we're not a monolith. But I think also eternally among us, we have to know that we're not a monolith, right? And I, and I shared one time, we were talking about, when we talk about black history, it's more than just, uh, you know, we say African-American history, but being black is sometimes broader, many times broader than being, african-american because some of us are from the continent of africa whether it's west africa or east africa or south africa then you also have afro-caribbeans right like where my parents are descended from they're jamaicans uh then you have african canadians those who came up through underground railroad and went to into canada and some went to uh western part of canada so you have and and obviously if you're if you're mixed with uh Spanish and you have sometimes the Afro-Latina, right? So I think for us, when we talk about being black, even among us, we said we don't want white people to put us in a box, but are we putting each other in a box because we don't respect that we have different ancestries? And race is what people say about you, but ethnicity is what we say about ourselves. That's how I kind of frame it. So how do we see, and how do we get people to understand our differences when we're not doing it among ourselves. And you see with the Vice President Kamala Harris, how difficult that conversation was. What do we put her? She's not African-American, she's not really, she's a black woman, but obviously she doesn't have that sort of uh, tenure or in terms of the pedigree for being in the US, but Afro-Caribbeans went through slavery too, right? Jamaicans, people from the islands went through slavery as well. It may not have been long, it may not have been so graphic, but it, we have gone through and had our ordeal. So just to be able to fight for ourselves, to be able to unpack that and know there's differences. And so that's just from just being black. Let me just kind of pause here because maybe you have stuff to say there. <laughs> no, no, you, you said a lot there. And that kind of really uh, positions us to, uh, you know, kind of for the next conversation, because sometimes that negotiating that, you know, amongst our own community, and then negotiating that with people outside of our community, you know, can be difficult. And I think uh, Vice President um, Harris uh, has done a really good job with that. And when we contrast that with how Tiger Woods handled it, you know, it's a stark difference, you know. So now what we really see, and, and some of it, you know, not to, you know, pile on to Tiger, right? I think we're we are in a different place than we were when Tiger, you know, um, was rising to his prominence. But you know, the way he kind of came off was like, I'm not really black, <laughs> right? And then you know, the context of that is, you know, how you may see yourself. And he is, uh, you know, uh, his his um, his mom is is um, uh, is Asian, um, and his. Um, his dad is African American, right? And so he wanted to honor his mother's side of the family, you know. But he didn't really handle uh, how he communicated that well, 
And right. also, you know, what people often, you know, have a difficult time uh, navigating is how does the dominant, how would the dominant culture see you and how would the dominant culture treat you based on whether, whatever you call yourself. <laughs> and that's the, that becomes what's the difficult challenge, you know, for us. Any thoughts mm -hmm. you'd like to add on that before we uh, go on to the yeah. next question? I, I, it is so tough because if you're from, if you're not in Canada or U.S., I'll let you know, race is not an issue. People who come from uh, the Caribbean or continental Africa, and you would call them Pan-Africans, uh, come to, to this continent, they know that they're black, dark skinned, but they don't see the sociological implication for being this. We do, being born here. And so initially people say, I am not black in that sense, but because of what our culture, how it, how it this color matters in terms of access and privilege. It gets imposed on people. So there is a conflict because they say, well, I mean, I'm Nigerian, I'm Ghanaian, I'm Jamaican, I'm Barbadian, I'm Dominican, right? We want to appeal to our, our, our ancestry or our ethnicity. But when it comes to power, which race is ultimately an issue of, it's the power dynamic. How is society divvying out the, the power? And so... I may be Jamaican ancestry or ethnicity, Canadian na in nationality, but I'm black in terms of the sociological power dynamics. And it's so hard for people to really grasp like the two. Now, some people who see themselves as black and see it in terms of ethnicity. And, and so black and African-American sometimes gets used synonymously. But there's others like Tiger Woods who said, no, I, you know, black is that's what you impose on me. And I'm other this because they're trying, like you said, are the whole biracial element or by ethnicity element, by cultural. So if you are half this and half that, that's the hardest for you because you're black passing, but you have, but you may be growing up in a white home uh, because for whatever reason, that's maybe that's one side of your family. And so I find that's even the, the more challenging because now you're like saying, well, I'm not really black because I don't have those black experiences, but people see me as black. So what do you do? So I would just say to people that race is more of the power dynamic. Now you can use race as an ethnicity in terms of how you build your culture, but sometimes some people disaggregate or unbundle the two and have ethnicity as their thing that they call themselves and they build and, now, and no longer or don't settle for what people see about themselves. And accessory, when I use the term accessory, it's kind of your, your line, your lineage. Uh, and then nationalities obviously relate to the country uh, where you are. And so that's what I would say that uh, if you're biracial or bicultural, it, it is a struggle. And for, for Black people, it is a struggle, especially if you're immigrating here. You don't really know that how important it is to understand the dynamics of being Black. It's, and so you have no choice to say, I am Black, but I'm also this too. Because um, I think if you ignore one, it's, it, it doesn't change the fact that society may will see you as this way. Um, absolutely. Well, you know, we can have a whole conversation on that. And yeah. uh, what I would like to make reference to um, people on the call, if you haven't read um, Isabel Wilkerson's book on cast, C-A-S-T-E, I think she does a phenomenal job of kind of breaking down the, uh, the power structures and why individuals, especially in, in the United States, how they have adopted people understanding the landscape because the concept of white doesn't exist outside of you know the United States in certain areas, but people have kind of come to the country, adopted that because they kind of understand the power dynamic and they see what goes on with the power dynamic, then people start to choose allegiances based upon the, the power dynamic. And I think that book clear does a really great job of explaining that concept. Mm -hmm. And so, Denny, what I like to kind of change gears uh, from is just go from an organizational perspective. And then those of you who, who may have some conversation, uh, some questions, go ahead and throw your questions um, in the chat. You can either put it in the general chat or send it directly to me. Um, I want to make sure that we get to some of your questions. Um, so when we think about organizations now, right? So, you know, we're, we've come to the place that we had this, this reckoning over the summer. And we have a lot of organizations now saying, you know what, 
uh, like the NFL, for instance, you know, <laughs> the NFL, you know, put a man out of a job, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and people uh, do often, you know, hijacked his message and said it was something else when he said it was something else, right? And to the po whole point now, they have a whole initiative and now investing, you know, what do organizations uh, do now, right? To deliver on their promise to um, create more um, um, environments that are conducive um, to be high performing, but also inclusive. What is one or two best practices um, that you would uh, that you would share tonight? Yeah, you know what? I use the term proximity. Proximity matters um, from the top down. Uh, I, I think that DNI has been a bottom up sort of endeavor. But I think for true organizational change, it has to be a top down. You need both, but if you want to pick one over the other, it has to be top down. Because at the end of the day, the leaders set the culture, right? John Maxwell talks about that in terms of his leadership. Uh, everything rises and falls with leadership. And if the CEO, COO, CFO have no proximity with people who are marginalized, have no proximity with people who are, are oppressed and disenfranchised within their organizations, right? Because the toxicity for many people in the, in the organization is akin to being in some of the swelters in some parts of the world. If those executives aren't close to the, the nexus, then they won't get it. And it's not enough to say, my people got it. My people have gave me data. Like data is good, but data needs to be qualified. The quantitative needs to be needs to be interpreted with a well frame of the qualitative. And you need those experiences, those lived experience, the visceral. That's why I love Undercover Boss, uh, that that reality television show, because it teaches us something, and people kind of maybe get lost in the entertainment value, but it teaches us that proximity matters because when those bosses get down into the, and they're with the front line, right? And they discover, oh my gosh, how bad my policies are that have created so much impact, they, they change. I don't know for how long, but at least at the end of the, the, the broadcast, they do. So I say proximity matters. And this, the second thing, DNI cannot be uh, done in terms of these sort of ancillary, periphery, uh, employee resource groups. My my take on it: those groups need to evolve to be a QA entity, which monitors the executive who now makes this part of their KPI. That makes it now part of their strategic plan and framework. And and so now it's less of let's kind of listen to some Black History stuff and and white speakers. No no no. How have you moved the needle in your quarter? How have we improved in the pipeline? Okay, we're not doing that. Okay, what is the gap? No, no, just tell us stories. We want to hear stories. We want to hear how, how you guys, uh, Jackie Robinson. No, no, we're past that. Because in the industrial age, we were looking at economics. But in the knowledge-based age, we have now moved into the ethics. And the children of the, of our, the parents are saying, you have a creed, you need to live up to it. What are you going to do about it? And the organizations are now trying to reflect society, but they need to, but the, the executives cannot push it down to, to the lower tier staff. They themselves have to own it and they themselves have to build it in. And that includes the board of directors because the board of directors say, I just saw all about the profit. They're part of the problem too. So they need to now understand Part of our metrics, part of a successful company that we're going to invest in, has balanced the economics and the ethics, and that we're making actually a substantive change in the society that, that we're living in. And I think so, those are the things I would say proximity and centrality of understanding the need to build DNI. Um, absolutely. Thank you, um, Denley, for a great answer. I want, I want to go to Elizabeth White. Um, she has a question here. Elizabeth, um, do you want to unmute and um, share your question? I think you you can you can say your question best. Okay, uh, thank you for that, and uh, thank you to the speaker and for you guys hosting this conversation. Um, 
so I was just sort of saying that I'm I'm struggling a little bit with the premise of the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And and what I mean by that is like sort of like the concept of DNI and this concept of Black people. Yeah. And I think a little bit because it it does feel like this conversation is being had universally mm -hmm. slash globally. Yeah. When in fact the experience and quite frankly, the identity is best defined uh, sort of locally, right? By country, by region, because we are all, whether American, et cetera, et cetera, you know, who we are due to ancestry, right? And so me being African-American, it's very appropriate me as an American to say I'm um, African-American. But my colleague who's in Brazil, who's calling herself black, uh, she's experiencing her own kind of racism, but her answer in Brazil is not going to look like, nor should look like the answer in America. And there's, you know, there's a history and laws and we don't need to get into all of that for that. So, you know, I guess it was more of a comment, but mm -hmm. maybe I could put it as a, as a question, but, I would hope, but I'm gonna ask if you in your work sort of, ex you know, articulate it that way, explore solutions in that way, because I do think that's gonna be the most authentic, okay, I'm answering, but I do think that's kind of yeah. the most authentic approach. Yeah. And that's how you get to, uh, you get closer to what looks like an authentic solution for people in that region. Yeah, yeah. Uh Good, good point, Elizabeth, and question. So I must say I've been blessed to not only speak to American audience and obviously Canadian audience and then obviously Caribbean, uh, but I also saw, spoken to those who are in, in England in, in the civil service. And you know what I've discovered? Oppression is pretty universal if you, are, or you look like this. Uh, so there, there is a common thread. But I won't. But I also agree that in the midst of this universality, there's this particularity where you're getting the whole idea of being lo the locality, the, the context. Context does matter, and so we can have dialogue and and exchange best practices among the Pan Africans, right? Uh, we are we're all Pan African uh, in terms of the experiencing. But then we say, okay, what does it mean in my local context? How do we flesh this out in such a way that speaks to the lived experience? I will say that diversity has been hijacked, right? Because I, diversity was actually more of a political term. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of Canada and the United States, it, it spoke more to how do we get more Black people in, in the United States and Canada? But businesses took it and diluted, and then we have to now come up with a term called anti-Black racism or anti-racism because now it's lost its meaning. But your point is well taken that uh, the context does matter and how we use the language of, to addressing that. Because like I said, if you're talking to people in South, South America, class is a big issue for them. So they, they actually lean into the subject first class then race. Uh, and, but North America, they lean in the subject race then class, right? So in the, um, this is my final point, if I may just kind of double down a little bit. So I've, I've traveled to eight countries, right? Going to school in England and France and worked in China. and. I work for JP Morgan. So I sit on these panels often, right? And we're sitting mm -hmm. on like global panels and we're talking about this kind of thing. And I recall when I was in England, I was hanging out with some Cameroon friends and they were telling me about their experience in Germany and they couldn't get, in, they couldn't get into the club. And so they said, uh, well, we're American, right? And then they would lie and say that they're American so they can get access, yeah. right? So they were sort of treated better. Um, we were on a recent panel around sort of regional, like, like, what is it like being black, right? One of these kind of conversations. And they tried to ask this question sort of similar, like as if all black people are the same. But see, here's the thing in America, and this is what makes it different from Canada and Africa and all these other places is, you know, our laws were more or less, were supposed to be written such that a person should have access as a man, as a woman, not as black as it, or white, right? Jim Crow really introduced this sort of race, this racism that we're all, that we're experiencing in America today. 
in Africa, their experiences due to imperialism, right? Their country was taken from them. So there's a completely different type of notion with respect to racism for someone. And I know that I'm generalizing it for Africa, but generally speaking. Um, so, you know, and so, and as a result have really been sort of cut out or, or you know, prevented from access from their own country. Black people in America are part of the fabric of the culture. And so the law tried to disavow Americans from access. So I really think, so while, you know, it's like that for certain people, and this will be my last point and I'll go back on mute, is I think we have to respect the, you know, foundations of the history that has created this experience um, and, and really talk about it in that kind of context because I think it's more disrespectful to lump us all in and say, well, you're scandalous like mine, so therefore, you know, and, and that's just not the reality. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good, good points. I, I definitely appreciate it. I, I will say that Canada has a very similar history. I, I think we're now discovering, not we, but collective we in terms of Canada, that we're, we have a, a very racist history. In fact, our... Uh, when you talk about George Washington uh, and, and those who were in Canada, one of our first, Sir John A. Macdonald or Sir Wilfrid Laurier, they said they wanted Canada to be a white man's country. They saw what was happening in the U.S. They saw the civil rights, uh, or I said prior to the really civil rights movement, but the civil war. They said, no, no, we don't want that. If we have too many Negroes in Canada, we, we're going to end up like in the U.S. Well, so it, they was, were, it was a safe haven back in the day, right? That's where the Underground Railroad led to. Oh, oh so not it exactly. Used to be, it used to yeah. be a safe place, right? No, but not exactly, because we did have slavery, but we didn't, we had, we were kind of like one foot in, one foot out in terms of the abolition. And so we weren't uh, encouraging slaves, but if, you ha if people had slaves, they didn't need to, to let them go. We had Jim Crow, similar laws in terms of, we had some of our African, uh, Americans who became African Canadians who went to Nova Scotia, which is the East Coast, but so where you look at Maine or, or like we say, New Brunswick, we had sort of laws because uh, Viola Desmond, who is one of our, our, let's say, the mother of our civil rights movement in Canada, wasn't allowed to eat at a certain, was allowed to, to be in a certain spot in the movie theater, which sparked her Rules of Parks moment. Before there was a Rules of Parks, she actually preceded her because there was a Jim Crow law. So we're saying that in Canada, I can't, I can't speak for uh, other parts of the world specifically, but what we're saying that the American experience is unique, but we also, because of the fact of people, the, the, the crossing of borders, uh, the politicians mingling, our law enforcement mingling, there are certain cultures that elements that we inherit that we uh, are quite similar. But again, not to not to as as graphic in terms of the, the Jim Crow experience, and I think that's that goes without saying. But I I, I would say that to be aware that uh, one, we in Canada, we're looking to you to see what are some of the best practices, and we can take it back here because the, we have in, the same indigenous issues that you guys have. In fact, maybe we're probably a little further along because the three L's I call it the the law, the land. And the labor where the lands of the indigenous were taken the labor of black folks were abused and the laws and just laws from white folks were imposed we we share that common thread and and so it looks differently in in specific locales but the north american context those three l's are, are quite prevalent absolutely i think some good points thank you elizabeth um, for sharing your your insights, I, I just also want to put a a, 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 a certain pin um, in it right there. Um, you know the whole concept of um, uh, black and white um, and the laws that you know really uh, created uh, the concept of black and white um, and the ability to have um, interracial marriage or not to have interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of those laws, you know, started way before Jim Crow, right? So 
the foundation <laughs> of, of um, in America, the concept of that in America, um, you know, um, just the way the constitution was created, um, you know, all those things have been utilized to disenfranchise African-Americans um, in this country. So I think we can all kind of agree on that. Um, and then also, you know, from my perspective, uh, especially being an African, you know, and I've been on five of the seven continents. And I can tell you when I go and negotiate um, a deal on behalf of the federal government, I'm sitting in a room, I'm, I'm whether I'm in Nigeria or, you know, say I'm in, in Kenya, um, and I have one of my white colleagues who may work for me. <laughs> you know, why is it that um, everybody looks at that person um, as if that person is going to make a decision? And when really the person that has the authority um, is uh, someone that looks like me, you know, because it, it's me <laughs> in that time. And so, um, so we have a lot of those dynamics. And so we're definitely, the point of our conversation today is, is not that we're all similar, is that there are different types of challenges that we may all face. And the perspective of how we face those things may be differently, may, it are different, you know, for a lot of um, folks. And then the whole concept of race, um, especially I've lived in the United States maybe 25, 30 years now, um, and what that means to different people, it means differently things to different people who experience the oppression um, that they have. Um, and so what I want to um, hit two questions, uh, Denley, that I mm -hmm. uh, want to hit with you is I want to talk about cultural competence. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, um, and I'm glad you brought up the concept of undercover boss. <clears throat> uh, one of the individuals um, that did Undercover Boss is Cat Cole. Cat Cole is the CEO of Cinnamon, uh, Cinnabons and uh, its associated brands. Uh, one of the things that she talks about from a leadership perspective is that it's the responsibility of leaders to get close to the front line so that they, because the people closest to the front line often have the problem, often has the solutions to the problems. However, they you typically don't have the language to be able to articulate, um, you know, the solution to the problem and how to scale yeah. the problem to the next level. So your idea of concept of our proximity is important. But I bring that up because language, being able to have language to describe the type of situations that we're in and the type of diversity or disenfranchisement that we are experiencing is very important. And so you, can you talk about the importance of cultural competency and upgrading our, our, our understanding of language and terms um, as we now navigate and work through this space? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I think the, the, the realm of the sociologist has bled over to popular culture, right? I mean, uh, whether it be terms like white fragility, code switching, right? Code switching is, we were talking about that of uh, uh, marginalized people flipping the switch to to be able to be in a, a, a white space or at least be in a, in a dominant space. Uh, you're, you're, you're thinking about now intersectionality of, of class and race and gender, how all that kind of gets woven together, right? Critical race theory. And so you find a lot of those things that we're talking about was, you know, they're, they're from the university sociology uh, lecture hall and that kind of bled in. And so uh, those are useful. I mean, it's just not just kind of <sighs> textbook stuff. I think the language and, and the thought behind it, I found has been useful within their workspace because the more plural, pluralistic and multicultural your your department becomes being able to understand being able to empathize proximity uh understanding they may be going through code switching uh the the, the idea of feeling oppressed that there's there's people who have their thumb on them all those things that come from the sociology world now seem to be more useful for business because in the industrial age you didn't care people were cogs 
Hence, we use the term human resources because we can just put people where they want because they're just resources. They're just not human beings. Now the language has now changed to people development, right? No longer human resources. Again, that, and now that speaks to the whole person, the, the authenticity. Uh, what can we do to let people to be, bring their full self? Uh, psychological safety. So all of those things now become important, which was in the sociological realm, now has been imported to business. The one thing I will say that last in terms of what I found very interesting, it's true, uh, Elizabeth kind of alluded to about context matters, because I remember I was working with Daimler and I remember working with a group of Germans in, in terms of their cards, and they would say, North Americans, you guys are so weak. All you guys want to do is song and dance and speak in roundabout terms. Just come straight. Be straight. And that taught me something that uh, you have to understand where people come from, because if you don't, when you think you're speaking diplomatically and you're thinking you're coming polished, people hear fraudulent, people hear you're not being truthful. And so knowing your audience is so critical, knowing where people come from. And I think if you're looking as a black business owner and expanding and going to these, these worlds or these nations, it's to recognize how do they do life? How do I get close enough? So I have the right language to fit or adapt into their into their space. Um, absolutely. One of uh, my mentors says that if you want to talk to people, use big words. If you want to connect with people, use language that they can understand and that they connect they can connect with. When you can speak the language of the people, um, not that you have to have exactly the the vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking in terms that people are able to connect with, that really makes um, a difference. And, and, the, and the point I want to kind of shift to, especially for those of us who have to navigate white spaces, is that uh, I think we need, to, I want to invite us to be intentional about making sure uh, that we start to up our cultural competence skills so that when we are having conversations and people are using words like BIPOC, that we understand and know what that means. When people are using words like unconscious bias or proximity, that we understand and know what those words mean so that we're, or someone brings up racial theory, that we can you know, be able to have intelligent conversations about these particular type of things, because otherwise it's just another set of words that people throw on us and we can't, and sometimes those that is used against us. Any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, some of it's colored by people go view in terms of political leanings, right? And I, I come and try to, I don't have a political leaning and obviously being from Canada, but, <laughs> uh, but it, it does because some people see some of these terms, all oh, these are just coming from left and liberal. Um, I, I think they're they're useful tools. I mean, and you have to use tools. Uh, the same butter knife can uh, can butter your bread or use it as a weapon, right? Yeah. How yeah. do you use how do you use that those tools is, is very important. So BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color, like in the U.S., that term is now becoming more in part of the the, the discourse. Native American is not seen as the term of choice, just like in Canada, Native Canadian. We went away with that. It's now in, it's indigenous. That's what they say we want you to address this as. And so, and you're seeing that now being played out with some of the football and sports teams and the Washington football team, right? This idea uh, that indigenous, what do the indigenous rights? And so being familiar with those terms are, are helpful if you're trying to make some social change. Uh, and by the way, I'm not saying deny, to forget about the, the social change that are, that are necessary for African-Americans or black, but just to know that uh, you want allies, right? And that's another term. You want allies or accomplices to help further your cause because the country will get continue to be more diverse in our both of our countries. And we don't want to be parochial and say, well, we got the more most oppression. That may be so, but people are <laughs> tend to be self-centered and say, well, if you're only thinking about yourself, we don't want to hang around or, or connect. The last thing I want to say, like BIPOC in, in, in Europe, they use the term called BAME which is black Asian minority, uh, at least experience at least, or ethnicity. And so if you're in Europe, they don't use the term BIPOC so much because they don't have so much indigenous people. They have really, it, it's black and Asian people to come over to England, for example, if, or Indian, India, 
And so they have different wording for that. So if you're do, having business out there, just be mindful that their, their idea of minority, their idea of Asian is not how we see Asian over here in, in the United States. Asian in the United States has more of a connotation of, of Vietnam, China, and Thailand. But Asian over in Europe or England has more of a connotation of the, the uh, India and Afghanistan and Pakistan. So those are some of the nuances you want to keep in mind. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, we could talk all night. <laughs> well, and, uh, so, uh, Denley, I want to thank you um, all. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing and sharing your insights um, with us. I want to thank you, all of those who provided questions and comments. If you haven't provided your LinkedIn profile, you know, please go ahead and provide your LinkedIn profile that you can continue the conversation um, going uh continuing the conversation um, going forward. Uh, also, I wanna encourage all of you, if you're not a member of Urban Financial Services Coalition, we invite you to consider being part of the family. We typically meet every Wednesday um, on a national level. We have local chapters across the United States. They, they meet on various different nights. You know, feel free to engage. You can find out more information about Urban Financial Services Coalition on our national website. Next week, we will have Dr. Pamela Jolly, um, and she will be talking about um, from head to heart. And uh, Dr. Jolly is also a theologian, also, you know, Ivy League graduate. Um, Dr. Jolly also has used her superpower um, to make a difference. She was one of the individuals tapped um, to work on economic empowerment for um, African Americans. Um, in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina, how could we bring them back economically? And so next week, she's really going to make a case for why uh, we should, um, as minorities in the financial services industry, um, what roles and responsibilities that we have to build community, what, uh, what um, opportunities that we have and what power do we have if we collectively work together? And if we um, take our different types of superpowers, how can we use that to close the wealth gap? And so that's going to be the center of our conversation next week. If you haven't registered, you know, please do. You can find out more information on our LinkedIn page. You can just put in Urban Financial Services Coalition. You can find our LinkedIn business page or our LinkedIn uh, group, or you can find us on Facebook by putting in Urban Financial Services Coalition, National Association of Urban Bankers, or you can visit us on our website. Um, Denley, any closing uh, thoughts before we close out? Yeah, well, D2, thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak and to all of you who have made the time to, to listen. Uh, I hope that this has been useful and you can let me know, put it in the chat as well. That I'd love to hear your feedback. I think one of the things I, I would just like to leave is that uh, we have to be able in this new world, or at least if you're trying to, to be financially uh, empowered and independent, to, to be able to transcend our, our local and, and think globally. And if we're gonna think globally, is to truly uh, risk, not just in a financial standpoint, but risk in terms of your heart, being vulnerable, understanding uh, what the world is not just doesn't revolve around a certain country or so locale. So my encouragement in terms of building in this area of acumen is, is to stretch because I learned a very long uh, a while a friend said that you know what you guys focus on this but what about us? And he said, well our, our issues are important, but I said, well, but we're we're oppressed too and we we're marginalized too. So I I look at oppression and marginalization is not only our issue but if anybody's marginalized or anyone's oppressed then we're in this together. And if I can understand your story, you understand mine, guess what? Uh, we're better together than our part. And so I would just encourage you in terms of how you look at your business, how you look at your finance, is to think globally, think cultural competency, and think about vulnerability and reach out and touch someone in a good way. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I think Dr. King said uh, a threat to uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, so we definitely, uh, we definitely believe that. And everyone, thank you so much. We appreciate you. You will be able to get more information or view this um, video again on the UFSC YouTube channel. Please unmute yourself and let's say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.
Good she night. Was. Great show. Have a great evening. Yeah. Good night. Evening. And thank, thank you, you all. Stay safe. Continue blessing. Good night. And thank you.